Good morning, friends, and welcome to our very first live stream here at United Christian Church. It's our first time doing it, so look, if you are going to start watching us on a regular basis, which unfortunately some of us just have to because of this whole COVID-19 thing and, you know, some folks of our, our senior citizens, they're on lockdown in their residences and they can out, can't get out. Others of us who are used to gathering in places of worship, we're finding that because either our numbers are too large or we have congregation populations where people are at risk. And so it's just not safe to gather. It's, it, it's not prudent. It's not prudent. We, do, we don't have a spirit of fear. But God has also given us some wisdom to think for just a minute, is this the right thing to do at this time? And so nobody wants to get sick. And so we're so grateful that we have this technology. So if you're watching for the first time, I promise you, kind of, that things and the way we do this broadcast is going to get better. We're going to add music and a lot of different things. But today, the first experiment that we're going to do together is that we're going to practice having virtual communion. I know. How are we going to do birth of communion? Well, this is how we're going to do that. On my end over here in TV land, um, I'm going to have, or Rick Bowden will have, a, um, um, the, the, the chalice with something to drink in it, and he'll have a little plate with a cracker on it or one of our um, unleavened breads, and um, we're going to have that. And so I want to encourage you at home, if you're watching and you want to get ready for our communion time, I want you to have virtual communion with us. So right now, I'm going to keep talking, but I'm going to send you to go do something. So I want you to go to your kitchen and find either something solid and something liquid. So that can be a piece of bread if you've got it, a crust of bread, and maybe some juice that you've had. We're going to pray for the elements together, so don't worry about that. Or maybe you just have like a piece of apple and some water or, or some milk or whatever you have. All you need in order for us to celebrate communion together is something solid and something liquid. So right now, go do that. We'll do some more virtual online housekeeping. So look, again, welcome to United Christian Church. This is our very first online worship experience. You can find us in two places. First, if you're looking at us now, you know that, hey, I found you on Facebook. And so that's right. You can go to United Christian Church, United Christian Church, D-O-C, I believe it is. I think, is that right? Someone tell me. Yeah. United Christian Church, D-O-C. That's our Facebook page. And you will find in that video section, bam, this broadcast. So you're watching it probably right there on Facebook. We're also be broadcasting on YouTube. So we have a YouTube page. That YouTube channel is United CC Hills for Country Club Hills. United CC Hills. Just type that in your YouTube search. We'll come up and you will see my smiling face. And that will allow you to find us and join us in worship. Again, as we go on and we get better at this and we kind of get the hang of it, if we have to, we're going to be adding some new things. Like we're going to add some music. We're going to add some other cool little things that I'm hoping will enhance your complete worship experience. I believe by now that you've received your, your, your you've got your communion together. So what I want to do right now is I want to pray for your elements as we pray for ours. Father, we thank you for these gifts of drink and these gifts of bread and something to eat. And we consecrate them right now for the moment of remembrance of Jesus Christ, for your great love of us and how his body broken and his blood shed have allowed us to be a part of your great family. We offer these gifts to you with remembrance and thanksgiving. We ask it in Jesus name. Amen. So now your communion is set. Set those elements aside. Grab your Bible if you have it, and, or your Bible or your tablet or your phone, whatever you use. It's the age of technology. And I want to invite you to turn to the Gospel of John. Now, we've been a series for this entire month. No, actually, the last two months, we've actually been walking through the whole Gospel of John. And so go ahead and find John, and we're going to be in chapter 11. Got it? John chapter 11. And if you were here in our worship space, I would say, if you got it, say amen. amen. If you don't got it, say, hold on, man. So while you're looking, please allow me to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment of worship like this with not just our united family, but many people who will discover us on this morning. And Father, we simply ask just a few things. First, wherever our viewers are, let your Holy Spirit fall fresh in those places that those who are watching might experience the true and living God through the power of your Holy Spirit. And then secondly, oh God, I step out of this clay vessel. I've never preached like this before. And so, Lord, I ask that you fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
I am so keenly aware that if you don't preach, there will be no preaching. So, Father, let the words that I speak, the illustrations that are used, everything that I do in this moment, allow it to point to the glory of Jesus. This I ask for the healing of our land, the blessing of your people, and the glory of your name. This we ask in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we are, and at United Christian Church, we've been studying this, the, the miracles of Jesus, starting, I think, last month. And so as we're walking through these miracles, we recognize in the Gospel of John, John does some unique things. And the unique thing that he does is that he only lists seven miracles of Jesus in his Gospel. And we are at big number seven. So now, just for those of you who are watching, you don't remember, the way that we have been remem memorizing this here at United is that we've had a, a, an acrostic called the sign, T-H-E-S-I-G-N. T is for turning water into wine, H for healing the noble and son, E for elevating the lame man or the healing at the pool of Bethesda, S for the supper for 5,000, I for the interim on the sea or Jesus walking on water, G giving sight to the blind, the man who was born blind being made to see, and then finally tonight, N, notification of Lazarus to come forth or the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And that is the miracle that we will study this morning together. So again, I invited you to get your Bibles, and we're going to look at a couple of passages in the Gospel of John. First passage will be in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. Then we're going to skip down to John chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 17 through 26. If you would, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. So if you have one, or our Bibles aren't going to be too different, follow along with me. Hear the word of the Lord. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured an expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about this, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But the disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea there were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? When we're speaking of Judea, they're talking about going into the area where Bethany is. Bethany is very close to Jerusalem. And Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. And during the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I will go and wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll soon get better. They thought Jesus meant that Lazarus simply was asleep. But Jesus meant that Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Jumping down to verse 17. When Jesus arrived in Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people who had come to console Mary and Martha about their loss, they had come. And when Mar Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, yes, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha? The story of Lazarus, it's, it's one of the, the, the stories I think that a lot of people know this story, but a lot of folks don't read this story. We don't read it, I think, one of, one of the reasons I think we don't read it is because it's kind of creepy. 
It's a story, if you get right into it, it's a story about a person that Jesus loved and everybody knew that he loved this family and Jesus let him die. Who wants to read that story? In fact, if I had a way to, to, to write my story, the end of my life story, it wouldn't be like, well, my best friend didn't come see me. It wouldn't be that. I'd write something different. In fact, I found something kind of funny as we're talking about it. Um, I, I found these stories about people who knew their life was at its end, and they wrote their own story. This first lady, her name is Emily Phillips, and she wrote her own obituary, and I'm just taking a little bit of an excerpt. She writes, it pains me to admit it, but apparently I have passed away. Everyone told me this would happen one day, but that simply was not something I wanted to hear, much less experience. I was born, I blinked, and it was over. She goes on to say, do your best to follow your arrow and make something amazing out of your life. Oh, and never stop smiling. Another person, his name is Aaron, I'm going to make sure I get his name right, Aaron Puremont. He wrote this about his life. Age 35, died peacefully at home on November 25th after complications from a radioactive spider bite that led to years of crime fighting and, year, and a years-long battle with that nefarious criminal named Cancer, who has plagued our society for far too long. Civilians will recognize him best as Spider-Man and thank him for his many years of service protecting our city. I just want to say parenthetically, at all times you should be yourself. But if you don't want to be yourself, be Spider-Man. I, I like the way that these people have, have, have shared what they, they wanted their lives to mean at their very end. It's easy to read these kind of stories. But this kind of story, Lazarus, whom is friends, he's boys with the Savior, who has healed many people, doesn't come when you're on your deathbed. And so, the free stuff. And for those of you who are watching for the first time, one of the things that I enjoy doing is giving to our congregation free information. I call it free information, but it's, it's stuff about the story, the background information about the sermon that maybe you won't find directly in the text or you're not putting all the pieces together. And I'm going to give you guys some free stuff. So here's the free stuff. In this story, Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha, and their home is in a town called Bethany. It's outside the western wall of Jerusalem, so it's a really close walk. It's also real close to Bethlehem, which is the birthplace of Jesus. So all of this, Bethany, uh, Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, all of this area very close together within walking distance of maybe just a few miles. It's, it's a place where Jesus felt very much at home visiting them, and I'm sure that between his visits through Jerusalem and other parts of the, of the, the, the Judean um, countryside, he often made frequent stops to visit his good friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We know that in, in John chapter 10, verse 40 and 42... That, that Jesus was staying in an area that's probably about 20 miles, um, let me see if I get my geography right, about 20 miles north and east of Bethany in Jerusalem, in an area called Perea, about 20 miles away across the Jordan River. It's roughly about a day's walk to get there. And that's where this story takes place. Jesus isn't very far away and could have gotten there soon. We learn then as chapter 11 opens up that there's a, a word that gets to Jesus from Mary and she says that Jesus, Jesus, come because my brother is ill. This Mary is the one that, you know, as we read earlier, she's the one that breaks open this jar of nard and pours it on Jesus' feet and then wipes it with her hair. Some have said that this is the woman who had been forgiven much. Or the woman who had demons cast out of her. I'm not real clear about all of that. But what I can say this is that she had a tremendous love and faith in Jesus. And so coming to him with a great measure of familiarity, she comes and says, Jesus, your boy is sick. As I read through this story, there are three things that I hope that you can take home that will be powerful living and also power for even some things in your life that just might be dying. They are the mystery and the sympathy and the power. First, the mystery. 
The, the most remarkable miracle that Jesus ever does is that he raises Lazarus from the dead. And what's so remarkable about that is that Lazarus had been dead for four days. Now, there are other instances where Jesus does raise other people from the dead. So it does happen. In fact, the first incidence we find in, in, in Luke chapter 8, verses 49 through 56, the healing or the, the, the raising up of Jairus' daughter. The text says that when Jesus was in Capernaum, Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, begged him to heal his 12-year-old daughter because she was dying. On the way, a messenger said not to bother because the girl had died. But Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, only believe, and your daughter will be healed. Jesus arrived to the house. He found mourners there wailing outside, and he said, she's not dead, but only sleeping. They laughed at him, and Jesus went in, took her by the hand, and said, my child, get up. And her spirit returned, and she raised up to life again. And Jesus ordered her parents to give her something to eat, but not tell anyone what happened. And then in Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17, Jesus goes to a funeral. The text says at the town gate of the village of Nain, Jesus and his disciples encountered a funeral procession. The only son of a widow was to be buried. Jesus saw her and his heart went out to her. And he touched the, 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 pier, the pyre where the body was being held and the bearers stopped. And Jesus told the young man, get up. The son sat up and began talking. And Jesus gave him back to his mother, and all the people around him were astonished and praising God. And he said, a great prophet has appeared among us. God has come to help his people. And now Lazarus. Lazarus, who not only had been dead for four days, he had already gone through the first stage of the embalming process. Here's another little free tidbit. One of the customs of Jesus' time is that on the third day that a person had died, the family or select members of the family would then go to the grave with spices and fresh wraps and cloths, and they would go in and they would begin to embalm the body, to preserve the body, then wrap the body, they'd put a layer of spices and then wrap it up, and then another layer of spices and then wrap the body up, and then they would place a napkin on his face. In a little while, we're going to talk more about this very process in Easter. And so, and folks are saying, well, why would they know that Jesus was in the grave for three days and when you try to do your math and count it out that like he died on this day and this day that's not three whole days I just want you to know the Jewish custom if you don't know anything else on the third day that's when they go to begin to prepare and embalm the body so that it wouldn't smell so badly and Lazarus he had been one day past that stage he was getting ripe and Jesus, in verse 4, he makes a surprising statement when this news comes to him. In John chapter 11, verse 4. But when Jesus heard about this, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Somebody died. And Jesus saying, uh, it's not quite what you think it is. Your, your, your eyes may very well be deceiving you because God has got a plan in this man's death. Jesus knew what was going to take place. He knew that death would not be the final outcome. The mystery in this story is that the way Jesus acted makes us scratch our head. No, no matter what you think of Jesus, the truth is he truly loved this family. Like I said earlier, Mary was probably the woman who had been forgiven much. And who knows, the ones who have been forgiven much are the ones who have an increased capacity to love much. Think about it. Have you ever been forgiven of something that you thought you couldn't be forgiven for? And when you finally realize that your slate has been swiped clean, don't you walk a little lighter? Hold your head a little taller. Feel just a little bit better because you know that the thing that you know that you were guilty of has now been washed away. That very well could have been Mary's situation. We also understand that from, from Martha, Martha was the one who, who, when we read about the show about Mary and Martha and how one's in the kitchen cooking and the other one's sitting there just digging Jesus and getting all the information and just sopping up this good teaching, that Martha, she was the one many, many times saw it as her honor and her pleasure to actually serve a meal to her Savior. And then Lazarus. Remember the proximity? Bethlehem, Bethany, they're not far away. It's, it's possible, just possible. I just want to throw it out there. This is just something I'm just thinking in my head. It's possible that maybe as Jesus growing up in his early days, 
That maybe he and Lazarus might have been boys. They grew up together. They threw rocks at the same, you know, the same chickens or the same donkeys. And they did all the things that boys do. They, they maybe possibly were close enough that they could have known each other for an extremely long time. I'm just talking about how Jesus easily could have loved this family. The mystery again. If Jesus had all these ties and all these connections, why did he wait for two more days? I don't have an answer. I don't really know. I can think of all kinds of stuff. We can speculate. But the truth is we don't really know, just like it is with the way that God deals with many of us today. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just take a peek into the mind of God and get a sense of what are you doing, God? Could you just let a brother in? That would be awesome. But it's not the way it happens. Things that we do know about God. Mom always used to say that God's ways are not our ways. There is so much higher than the way that we can think. Or even the scripture says that God plans our lives from the end to the beginning. And so after going through this, this, this death, after going through all this, some of us, we don't get what God is doing until we get to the end of our trouble or the end of our strife or the end of our struggle. Jesus loves us no matter what happens and no matter what you're going through. The mystery of our lives, even if you don't get it, even if you don't like it, you don't understand it, the truth of it all is, no matter what it is, God's love is constant for you. And for some of us who think that we're unlovable, even that is a mystery. But here's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Can anything ever separate us from the love of Christ? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we're in trouble or calamity or if we're persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love, neither life nor death neither angels nor demons, neither the fears for today nor the worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be ever able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved, our lives and the, the weaving and interweaving stories of our lives we don't know what the next page or the next chapter will bring, but one thing that we can count on, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus, is that we can never be separated from the love of God through Christ. And that's a mystery. Part number two, the sympathy. Mary meets Jesus in verse 32. And she, she says this, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. The faith in Jesus to believe that if Jesus could, just could have been there, her brother would live. And Jesus says to her, where have you put him? And they told him, Lord, come and see. In the next verse, in verse 33, the text says that Jesus groans in his spirit. Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with deep anger. Some of your translations may say Jesus was deeply troubled in his spirit. This, this troubling, this anger, this, 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 this feeling of mourning welled up in him. And the text says he was deeply, deeply troubled. Everyone wailing, everyone mourning. And one thing that we find clearly in this space is that Jesus did not separate himself from what was going on. But Jesus became a part of what was going on. And in verse 35, one of the shortest passages of scripture, it says, Then Jesus wept. Jesus burst into tears. 
How we love that family. How we loved Lazarus. There are only two times in Scripture that we find about Jesus even weeping. One is here, and the other is that he weeps over Jerusalem. Let me ask you this when we think about this passage of Jesus' compassion, his, 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 his weeping, his, his, his anger, his grieving anger coming forth at this moment. What do you do when you see something wrong in the world? Or when you see people greeting? Let me just make it even simpler. What do you do when you go to a party? Do you sit against the wall like, you know, hmm. You watching everybody get down, and you just kind of like, mm. no, when you're at a party, you party. But there is something about this aspect of grieving, something about when we're in the midst of, of, of something that shouldn't be, something that ain't right. Lazarus maybe shouldn't have died. Or you can fill in the own, your own blanks. Who shouldn't have died? What are you grieving? Or what have you witnessed? What grieving have you witnessed? As I dive into this, one thing I recognize, and we can take a lesson from Jesus, that when you are among those who are mourning, if you don't know anything else to do, mourn with them. There's a story about a little girl that got this, this beautiful little china doll and she took it and she, she was so excited she shared it with her friends and says, look what I've got and the two little girls took it over to her house and played with it and the, the, the little girl's daddy, little, little girl too, her daddy says, look, you can go play but at dinner time you need to come home, okay? Okay, daddy. Well, a terrible thing happened. The, the little girl, girl one, she broke her china doll and time passed. And daddy looks at his watch and he's wondering where his daughter is. And he finally goes next door to the neighbors and looking for her and says, baby, it's time to go. It's time for dinner. Why didn't you come home? And the little girl says, my best friend broke, broke her china doll. And so I stayed here to help her cry. Beloved, that, that, that is the thing that I believe that is missing in our society today. There are more than enough things for us to just look out into our windows of the world and find righteous anger and indignation. There's enough in this world that's going on that we should be grieving. But you know what we end up doing? We would rather tweet about it than be about it. That we much rather just be passive bystanders and just look at it and just type out a few characters and say, yeah, this went, went down and this, this is too bad. And then once the tweet is gone, thinking that we've now made our righteous stand, yes, I tweeted about something, and we go on about our business, but still the indignation stands. We never shed a tear. We never joined the fight. We never did anything to be a part of what was going on or to make a difference. We just simply pop out a few characters and keep it moving. The world, beloved, right now, right now more than ever, is weeping. And I don't have to get all deep into the number of subjects. You can just stop and look at the newspaper or watch the news. But at some point, our hearts need to be like Jesus' heart. And we should shed a tear or we should join the fight. That we should find ourselves in the crowd with those who are grieving and we should break down and shed a righteous tear. The sympathy, the connectedness, the compassion and the passion all rolled into one. Jesus wept for the death of Lazarus. If we gain anything from this part of the sermon, know that when you're in a space where our hearts should be broken, don't keep calm and carry on, but shed a tear and join the morning. And then lastly, lastly, it's the power. The power, this is the amazing part I have heard over the course of my life a number of sermons about this part of the scripture where the text tells that Jesus tells everybody to take him to the place where they've laid him. They even warn him saying, um, Jesus, he's 
four days past the, or he's, he's four days in the grave, one day past our embalming period. We embalm him the third day because he's going to start smelling bad. And you want to go over there? And Jesus says, roll the stone away. And they're like, uh-uh. We're not real crazy about that. He says, do what he tells them to do. They roll the stone away. And Jesus speaks to Lazarus and says, come forth. Now, I've heard preachers tell the story that Jesus had to, to say exactly that because if he just said, come forth, everybody who might have been buried in the grave, everybody would have raised up from the dead because Jesus said, get up. But one thing that is consistent about what Jesus did with every time he raised somebody from the dead is that Jesus spoke to that individual from healing of the, the child at Nain. He spoke to Jairus' daughter. He spoke, and even to Lazarus, he spoke to him, and Lazarus came forth. Beloved, as I bring this message to a close, can I just tell you right now that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you are living in the power of the resurrection, I just want you to know that the power that raised Jesus from the dead also is the power that lives and works in you. And there may be a thing or two in your very life that you feel like is limping, is weeping, it's dying. It may have even died. But can I speak to you across the internet? And I want to say to you, let that thing that has been lost, that dream that you thought has been long dead and gone, that hope that you have given up on ever coming to pass, maybe it's a child that's been far away and not returned, maybe it's a spouse that has somehow gone wayward, maybe it's a broken marriage or relationship, whatever it is, can I just tell you right now, begin to tell it to come back to life in the name of Jesus. It is my belief and it is my hope and it is what I'm holding on to that if we would just, if we would just live into the power that Jesus gives us through our prayers, through our righteous actions, through our faith, that there are some things that we will begin to see the stones rolling away and the thing that we thought was long gone would indeed begin to breathe again. And so, beloved, I bring this message to a close. That there is nothing that can separate you from God's love. Don't get lost in the mystery of life. Know that in your struggle, Christ is closer than your very breath. And know that God gives us the authority that we might speak life that we can tell the things in our lives that come forth in faith. So my friends, this morning, in this our last and final miracle of Jesus, can I just tell you and pray that you would hold on to this for this whole week, that I believe that this can be hope for you, strength for you. I offer it to you as the word of God for the people of God. Jesus is Seventh miracle in the Gospel of John. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. We have reached the heart of our worship service here at United Christian Church. I am Darren Bowden, assistant minister here at United Christian. And earlier this morning, Reverend King invited you to get some solid and get some liquid. We're going to participate in Holy Communion, remembering the greatest act of love ever known by mankind. On the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was betrayed, he gathered in an upper room and his disciples were with him. He said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat of it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to him, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Shall we take the bread and eat together? Likewise, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup represents the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remissions of all sin. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. Shall we drink from the cup together? My brothers and sisters, I understand we serve a risen Savior whose kingdom has no end. Peace and blessings be to you all. Love you.